Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with James Scott Bell. Hi Jim. Hi, nice to see you. Oh, it's good to have you back on the show. But just in case people don't know who you are, just a little introduction. James is the best-selling and award-winning author of thriller novels, zombie legals, historical romance, and lots and lots of excellent books on the craft of writing. He's a professional speaker, teaching novel writing and other skills for writers. And today we're talking about his book, How to Make a Living as a Writer. It's always hard to introduce you, Jim. Well, that sounded great to me. So, uh, no, I love it. This is good. No, those are the two things. Uh, I can. Some people are teachers and writers. I consider myself a writer who also happens to teach, mm. and but both of those tracks have always been on my radar, and I enjoy both. Mm, me too, and that's what, you know. I feel like we get on on that way. But I wanted to start by just um, you know saying right up front. Uh, Yes, I stole half your title for my book. Um, so my book is How to Make a Living with Your Writing, and yours is How to Make a Living as a Writer. Now, of course, I emailed you about this and apologized, but you were a lawyer. Can you explain to everyone copyright on book titles? Is there such a thing? Generally speaking, no. How, you know, however, I would not write a book called you know, Gone with the Wind Part Two. <laughs> or the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> yeah, you've got to be a little bit careful about, about those. But generally speaking, titles are not copyrightable. Mm. Um, and you've just got, but you've got to be sensitive to the audience because, you know, some of them may think you're trying to write this or trying to t rip off that. But mm. as long as, um, you know, the, the, the content is what counts. And uh, I, think, I think your strength comes from thinking in terms of, of a business person, which, you know, is what your background is and taking those principles and applying them. Uh, what I try to do is come at it from someone, from people who, who consider themselves writers, mm -hmm. who want to write. They want to write fiction primarily, but also nonfiction. That's what they do. And then I wanted to help them incorporate business principles because I have an entrepreneurial background too in in order to support their writing so i think if you put these two books together you have a graduate course in making a living oh yeah and i love it and, and also i was wondering if you think the same way is that i think there's been a maturity in the indie market these books were never around before there never were business books for authors were there it's there's been always craft books but do you think that's because authors are becoming more mature or the indie market is maturing well, it, it's partly that. There was, there was a niche in the uh, old world, we'll call it the old world, pre-2007, called the freelance writer market. And mm. the, the people who made it as freelance writers were those who understood how to produce work, how to research the market, how to find niches. And so some of those basic principles from that, that era do apply and now that we're, now we're, try, we're picking these things up and giving them to indie writers so that they understand that it's uh, partly business, partly creativity, partly marketing. And you put, you put all those things together, you have the best chance of making some real income. Mm. And, and um, that was more for nonfiction writing, though, was it? Primarily. I mean, yeah, was it? I mean, Dean Wesley Smith, Smith talks about the pulp writers. Um, right. but, but for fiction writers, there hasn't really been that much business education, has there? Certainly not in the that, MFA space. That's right. That's right. The old pulp writers primarily survived by being very prolific mm. and, and then find, finding markets. So it, when they had pulp magazines that, that covered all kinds of genres from adventure to detective and so on, you know, they would look at that market and they would try to write to that market. But being prolific was what counted. Now, some of that is true today for indies is that it's, it's quality and production over time that really is the key to the whole thing, I think. Mm. And, uh, and you are prolific, I would say. I think, you know, you have lots of books coming out, fiction and nonfiction. And a year ago, you were on the show uh, talking about one of your, um, your dialogue books. Um, but what, what's happened with you over the last year? Because what I love to see is, you know, even experienced writers are learning new things, aren't they? So what, what have you tried in the last year that, that you're interested in right now? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the basic fundamental for me is always to to keep up the production in a way that uh, doesn't sacrifice quality, what I call quality. That, that term, of course, is open 
for uh, interpretation. It doesn't. I'm not necessarily talking about literary quality that would win some kind of uh, literary award. I'm talking about when you tell a story, no matter what genre you're in, you do things that make that story connect with readers. That kind of quality is the is the main thing. Uh, I think over the last year, I've um, I'm participating in a boxed set uh, of, of writing books. That is one way to gain a lot of exposure for your material. Uh, and another major feature for indie writers, of course, are these deal uh, alert newsletters, where you know, BookBub is the the primary one. It's the big one, but it's very selective, so it's hard to get into. It can be frustrating for newer authors and so on. But there are a number of others, and I think a systematic use of those mm -hmm. is a wise idea because they're not very expensive. And even if you, even if you don't make back that initial investment, which is usually very small, over time you're going to make r new readers from those, and those new readers have a value. So really you're in kind of investing for the future, and that's what you need when you're starting out especially is to get readers reading your work mm -hmm. and then your work has got to do the heavy lifting that mm. never changes mm. and you uh, you were saying that you're, you've done a book trailer this time and uh, you know book trailers go in and out of fashion and I've actually done some recently too why have you done a book trailer now okay well I am about to release a new thriller that is uh, the start of a new series and my son is a videographer and film professor and he he suggested, why don't I do a trailer for you? The price was right. Oh, yeah, uh, fair enough. <laughs> but I did, actually, I did pay him uh, uh, the, a going rate. But I just, I felt, I had an idea for the trailer. And my quick thumbnail review of trailers is, I think that most, if they're over 30 to 45 seconds, if they're over that, I think they're too long. I think readers need to be captured. It's like a, when you see a movie trailer on on TV, it's not very long. Mm. So I'm going to try this. Uh, it's just for fun. I've got a YouTube channel, so I will upload that probably this week, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. This week as we speak. <laughs> and one of the um, – what's in, just coming back on the box set. So obviously, I mean, the beginning of last year, I was in a box set that, that hit the New York Times and USA Today, and then they changed all the rules, right? So actually now, I don't believe that a box, a multi-author box set can hit the New York Times, certainly the New York Times. I think it can still hit the USA Today. Um, so what is, and, and I, I know that a lot of goals are really important. What is the goal to just get more readers or what is the goal going into the box set for you guys? Yeah, I think that's the primary goal is to go out wide to as many people as we can and at a very reasonable rate, 99 cents. Hmm to get our material out to new people. I mean, it's part of the discoverability process. So we'll all kind of cross pollinate, hopefully from our various lists and so forth. Um, and since it's a book that has already been done, um, then it's, you know, it's not a, a huge time investment. Mm. So that's the key. Um, and you know, if we sell enough and maybe make it to the USA Today list, that would be gravy. Yeah. Well, and I think that's really important. Like none of all the things you've talked about so far actually cost money. Actually doing a multi-author box set generally costs money, right? You have to get a cover. You have to generally pay someone to put it together. Then you have to pay for advertising. And then if you split the money between all the authors, you you may not even make that much money. So right. I think that marketing is the point. So just tell people what the box set is, because I think it's of value to people listening, right? Absolutely. It's it's called Writing Success, and it's available for pre-order as we speak. Um, I'm not sure when we're going to air, but uh, it will. It's certainly going to be available, mm. and it's 99 cents. It's on all the retailers, and uh, you can look under my name and another. The the, the first name is Karen Ball, and she's a well-known editor. She's now an agent, but she was my editor. Uh, for a, a few books that I did back in the day. So she's very good. And we have a number of other people. So there's seven books in all, seven writing books mm. on the craft of fiction. And just, a, I mean, it, it really is uh, hard to beat that deal. Yeah, right. 
good. I'll put links in the show notes to that. Right, I want to pick some things out of your um, your book that uh, there are some good quotes in there. Uh, so, and you mentioned the word systematic before, and I, I always hear, you know, creative people are cringing at words like systematic. So uh, try this. Uh, in your book, it says, uh, a writer needs a disciplined approach to hard work and fundamentals. So there's the word discipline. You also mentioned writing quotas and production plans. Like these are all scary words. So what do you mean by these things and what does your personal approach look like to fiction and nonfiction? Well, uh, when I look back at the successful writers uh, under the old system and especially those old pulp writers and the paperback writers of the 50s and 60s, what it came down to was, you, you know, you can't sell what isn't written and you have to produce the words. I the best advice I ever got, in my opinion, was very early in my career, was to write to a quota. Now, I know some writers get, you know, the creative types <laughs> sit, get very nervous about that because they, they think it somehow impinges on creativity, but it doesn't. The opposite is true. It forces you to be creative. Mm -hmm. And that's what a professional is. A professional is someone who does the work even when they don't feel like doing the work. So my advice always to writers is figure out, you know, you have all kinds of lives out there, people, you know, with family responsibilities, day jobs and so on. Just figure out what you can comfortably write in a week. Mm -hmm. How many words can you comfortably write? Maybe it's only, say, 500 words or 800 words. Then up that by 10% and make that your goal and then divide that up into work days and try to do it by the week. And if you do that, just you know, day after month after year, you'll be amazed at what you can produce. And when I look back over 20 years of doing this, I've written a ton of stuff that almost amazes me. But it's, it's not because I'm superhuman. It's because I've done the quota system every, you know, regularly every single um, year. And I can tell you precisely on a spreadsheet how many words I've written since the year 2000 so wow. and then the other thing the other thing is the systematic idea of per, of developing your ideas your your concepts your books what do you what are you going to write i think it's a combination of studying markets to be wise and then putting that together with what you really feel passionate about writing and and trying to put those two things together and be productive and that, you know, if you spend time planning, you've got to spend some time planning. All businesses, successful businesses, plan. Mm. Just apply that to writers. It's funny. I've uh, I've have in the last couple of weeks been I started co-writing for the first time, and what's been brilliant is every day, every day, f the five day working days of the week. You know, although of course we all write weekends. Um, I have to get my words done because he's in America, and I know when he wakes up, I have to have done my words, and it's really helping. So now I'm like, how can I get this this accountability when I'm writing on my own? <laughs> So, Good point. Yeah, well, it, how how do you? I mean, do, is yours just your spreadsheet? Like you have to fill in your spreadsheet every day? That's Yeah, that's one one way I do that is I, I have the spreadsheet. I have names of projects on the spreadsheet, and I it tallies up the words that I write each day, gives me a weekly tally. Mm -hmm. And I look, that's that's the number that I really concentrate on. And it is. It's, a, it's sort of self-accountability. And I try to get writing done early in the day. I try to get at least part of the quota done early. So I sort of tell myself, you know, I'm not going to go on uh, and do email. I'm not going to go on and l look at the, the news uh, until I get a certain number of words done. I, I used to call it, well, I still call it the nifty 350. As I try to write 350 words first thing before anything, 350 words. Mm -hmm. Once I do that, I've made a good start to reaching my quota for the day and it just makes the day go a lot easier. Mm. And uh, it's interesting because I had an email from a reader this week and uh, I, I wanted to ask you about it. So it basically says, all the advice from established authors seems to be that if I write a number of books, it is inevitable I will make a living with writing. Is that really true? Ah, well, there's, there's one little caveat there that's very, that's, that's major and I mentioned it earlier. And that's quality. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, remember in the movie The Shining uh, when he, she, the wife sees that stack of paper that he's been typing for all those yeah. weeks, and it's all just all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. You know, this insane. Now, you can't publish that over and over again and expect that that automatically is going to lead to income. So it's a matter of learning the craft of storytelling. There's mm -hmm. two tracks I, I advise always with writers. I say, you know, do, do the writing, be creative, but also study the craft and get better at what you do. So it's, it's, it's a matter of creating a, a commercial product that enough readers are going to want to buy. Mm. Now, in the old days, again, it took writers of fiction, first of all, very few writers of fiction ever made a living from fiction, but it took them a long time, years in most cases, to learn how to write successful fiction. It took me several years to learn how to do that. So don't be impatient, hmm. but be methodical in learning the craft and just keep getting better. And you can do that. Any, any writer can start from where they are and learn what to do to get better at, and better as they go along and just keep those two things going. Mm. And you're someone who believes that talent, you know, raw talent is not really true and you can learn anything, right? Well, I believe that talent is a factor because, but I, I think virtually every person who has the desire to write and has grown up reading mm. has an, an inherent talent. The, then the trick is to take whatever inherent talent you have and to make it better, to nurture it, to bring it out through the the study of the craft. I believe anybody can do that. I also believe that there are naturally gifted, very talented writers who never achieve great success because they think they don't have anything to learn mm -hmm. or they think it's below them to try to learn. So that that's true in all endeavors. It's true in athletics and it's true in in the arts. So if you have the desire to write and you have a work ethic, you can get better. Hmm. And this, this question, you know, about uh, is it inevitable, um, I guess it's not inevitable if also if you write books that are not sellers, like they might be really good books, but there are plenty of literary fiction or say uh, poetry authors who will never be able to make a living, right? They have to be, com they actually do have to be commercial in some way. True. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I use kind of a Venn diagram idea is that the, the, the key is to take the one side, which is where your heart is, your passion is, what you love to read, what you want to write, what's the kind of stories you want to tell, that's one side. Then the other side is commercial and, and, and marketability. That's the, side, that's the side that a traditional publisher looks at when they're acquiring books. Mm. That's the, the main thing they look at. I mean, this something may be great literary quality, but they're asking themselves, we got to make money. We're a business. Can we sell this? And so if you as a writer can find that sweet spot in the middle there where, the, where these two things intersect, that's what you should be looking at. If, you re, if you're truly serious about wanting to make some income at this mm. and perhaps even get to the level where you're making enough uh, to make a living at it, you've really got to marry those two things. Mm. And it's funny because um, this co-writing book I'm doing, and it's an idea I've had for years and years and years, and it's, we don't know what it is. It's one of these cross-genre books. It's kind of dark fantasy, maybe post-apocalyptic, difficult to put into a category. And I'm, I'm at the point of going, oh, whatever. Someone will, you know, eventually will figure out. So somebody will buy it. But, th but stories can sell forever, right? So fiction is a slow burn, but the more books you have, the better, really. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um also, when you do something that seems sort of genre breaking, as you might be suggesting, suggesting uh, that's, that's good because if that catches fire, then it becomes a leader in that sort of new uh, niche that is opening up. That's what I did with the zombie legal thrillers. Mm, yeah. you know, that <laughs> there were legal thrillers and there were zombie books. I said, let's, make, <laughs> let's do legal thriller zombie book. So um, I enjoyed doing it. And so... That's, that's what you need to do. Yeah, like you said, you need to have fun, you need to be creative, and then you also need to think about, well, where, where, can, I, where can I market this? And uh, if, it's, if it's great storytelling, it will 
it will find some foothold. Mm. And I'm definitely having fun with this one. It's, uh, it is, it's, and it's, I think that comes through, doesn't it, in the book, when you're actually having fun, that will communicate to the reader and they'll probably Absolutely. enjoy it more. So, and I think I've only began, begun to have fun because I've relaxed a bit. So That's good. And you presumably I, did writing zombie legals, right? I mean, you don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> I absolutely believe that when you have fun, it, it, there is an old um, writing text that I found from 1919 on the fundamentals of fiction by this professor. You know, and one of the things he said was that there's a certain joy that you sense in people who, who are telling stories that they love to tell. He pointed to Robert Louis Stevenson and Treasure Island. And I would point to Edgar Rice Burroughs mm. and his books about Tarzan and his books about Mars. He's having fun w telling this story and weaving this yarn. And um, years ago, Lawrence Block, who was mm. a fiction columnist at Writer's Digest and a great crime writer, and um, someone I read religiously, and then I got to be the fiction columnist myself, so it was sort of like you know getting the tablets from Moses. Um, he, uh, he once wrote a column about that, and he said that Stephen King seems to have that quality where... It's like he's inviting you in to weave you a story, and he's having so much fun telling the story. I do think that that has a quality that is evident. Mm. Is, is Lawrence Block the guy who also wrote uh, Erotica as a woman? I, I can't remember <laughs> if he did as a woman, but he, maybe he did. I mean, maybe he did. I know he did write sort of softcore yeah. back in the 60s because that, frankly, is how a lot of... <laughs> authors like him were trying to make money yeah. <laughs> while they did their legitimate work. So yeah, I think he's the same guy. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll find a link and put it in the show notes. But that is actually happening a lot now. There are a lot of people who are using pseudonyms and are quite, you know, literary authors by day and are writing other things um, by night, I think. And like, and that's what's so great right now, isn't it? We can write these different things. So I wanted to ask you about that because um, you write nonfiction and you also write fiction. And I do get lots of questions where people say, how can, how can a nonfiction writer, like someone who is used to writing, I guess, truth or opinion or, you know, within that in the way that you have to write nonfiction, uh, how can that person switch to writing fiction? How can they become more imaginative? I think people mm. are sort of blocked by this, you know, nonfiction fiction thing. How, how would you mm. suggest people break through that? Mm. Interesting. Um, well, I think nonfiction writers, like any other kind of writers, technical writers, people who write for computer magazines, whatever it may be, they have to learn the craft just like everybody else. They, they have to learn the fundamentals of storytelling, which um, are easy to understand if they're, if they're taught in the right way, but then they have to be practiced. And so for a nonfiction writer, I think maybe the strength that they can bring is their attention to detail. And one of the things that a good fiction writer will do is be able to put in realistic, and significant detail in writing of their scenes and so on. But I would suggest that the, the, uh, an exercise called writing practice, which is where you begin very early in the morning, or you know, as soon as you can, you, you write without stopping for five minutes, five, ten minutes. One of the ways you can trigger that is to take a dictionary, open it at random, and pick the first noun that you see and just write for five minutes on that. And what you're doing is you're trying to shut off your editorial mind and just let your let the words flow. That's a great practice. I've done that. I, I continue to do that from time to time just to sort of loosen up and let the imagination take over. So that might be one suggestion. And then get some really good books on the craft. Maybe take some classes and uh, just keep studying and practicing and learning and growing and writing that quota. Yeah, and, and again, maybe not taking yourself so seriously. Like, I meet a lot of lawyers, actually, who want to <laughs> write fiction. And, yeah. you know, as a lawyer, you're taught to be really stilted and really kind of, no, you can't say that just in case. And, and you've got to let all that go, haven't you? Writing right. fiction, like, the more I feel like I lean into what I almost lean into the first draft, I feel now. It's like, all right, just let it, just let it go. Stop thinking you're so stupid and, and silly uh -huh. by coming out with these things. So uh, can you... 
take yourself back to that point where you started writing fiction you know did you have to sort of deliberately get rid of that analytical side interesting um yeah and i had i've been told when i was in college that if you don't really have what it takes you have to be born with this talent and if you don't really have it you can't develop it and i clearly didn't have it because i was taking a class from raymond carver this great literary master, and I wasn't able to do what he did. So I thought for years and years you, you couldn't learn it. But then as you know, I've been to law school, and then I had you know the desire to write came back, and I approached it like I would studying a course in you know constitutional law or contracts. I got books and I studied them, mm. and I was determined to try to learn. And now what I initially started to do was uh, learn as a screenwriter because I was living in Los Angeles and everybody in Los Angeles has to write a screenplay or, or you're not allowed to live here. So uh, I learned from that, I learned about structure. I learned about dialogue. I learned about writing cinematically. And so when I transitioned over to fiction, those were strengths that I brought with me. And so I, th I, I think over time, well, you know, there was, one, there was one point early on when a light bulb went off. I'd been studying and I'd been trying things and it was elusive and I wasn't quite getting it. And then I read something in a book and it, all of a sudden it all came together and I took mm -hmm. this gigantic leap. And that was really when I started to, to sell. So, yeah, it happens. Mm. Yeah, and I think we're similar that way. Like I spent a lot of time and still do, you know, we all do. I've, I own most of your books, you know, as it, we're always learning, aren't we? New, new books come out. I think writers own, you know, loads and loads, like hundreds of books on writing, and that's completely normal. <laughs> yeah, well, you can see behind me, my shelf is full of writing books. Oh, there we go. Uh, the, I love that shelf because those are all the books that I've read and I've highlighted mm. and I can take them down when I need help in a certain area or I want to remember something. Mm. Do you have a vanity shelf as well with all your own books? <laughs> no, I don't have a, well, I have one shelf where I keep one copy of all yeah, my yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. But I'm a, I, I, I was a, amused to see that Dean Koontz in his mansion <laughs> has an entire room, like a library, <laughs> with all of the editions for, you know, of all, all his books. All the foreign ones, yeah. And he says he goes in there from time to time and looks around and says, yeah, I can do this. I did it before. <laughs> So I, I love that. And that's interesting, actually, because that I can do this. I've done it before. Um, I, so many people say, you know, like that emptiness you feel when you finish a book. You feel you often, well, I do, you know, you feel like I will never write a book again. I'm completely empty. And what you just said there about Dean Koontz, and I've heard it from all writers, is everyone feels the same. Yeah. We all go through the same stuff, don't we? Absolutely. I, uh, you know, I have a number of professional writing friends, people who've been you know, best-selling writers for years and years, and they say the same thing. And they say, why is it harder? And one of the things I, I say is that, well, for one thing, your standards keep going up because you know more. Mm. You know that you've done something, and you know when you haven't done something, and you know that you want to reach for this. So it, it, consistently, the bar is set high, and so you're naturally nervous about that. But that's okay, because just like a pole vaulter who wants to go, you know, that, that extra inch uh, higher on the next jump, that's, that's you know, kind of nerve-wracking to look up there and see that. But you do it, and you get better, and you get stronger. And yeah, it, it, it does, it, it does uh, happen again, because you know so much, and you can do it. Now, on the opposite side, I will say that there have been some mega best-selling writers who toward the end have just kind of mailed it in who mm -hmm. and you can sense that in their books that you know now they don't have to try they know that they'll get a certain amount and um, I don't ever want to to be in that position I always you know writing means so much to me and the readers mean so much I don't ever want to shortchange them mm. and we 
can you know you do, I think that happens when people just feel like they have to write the same book over and over again whereas you know what's nice being an indie you don't have to write according to what somebody else tells you so you don't have to write a 25 book series um because your publisher says you have to um right. like I'm reading techno thrillers at the moment like futurist like you know 2040 kind of not sci-fi I would say like techno thrillers kind of sci-fi and I'm like I really want to write a techno thriller and that's not at all my niche right now but there's no reason why I can't write that is there I mean you know that's it like you with your zombie thrillers and uh, that's one of that's one of the you know great things about indie and you know there's so many great things about in the indie world I mean it's an amazing thing to think about for writers I mean come on I mean you know 50 years ago there's no way you could be a self-published writer and and do anything with it and, and even 20 years ago but uh, anyway the the nice thing about it is you can also do short form work and mm. test things. And you know, I've got a couple of short story um, series that I just done because I, I I wanted to try it. I like the voice. I like the concept. And then perhaps I can uh, put those all together in an omnibus, or maybe I'll write a, a, com- a complete book someday. But it's there for the opportunity. Mm. Now, I I did want to come back on the kind of the mindset thing, because one of the other quotes uh, in the book is, uh, and you actually quote David Eddings, um, this profession is not for the delicate, uh, (laughs) and authors need to develop calluses on their soul, which I think is like, is quite hardcore. So what do you, what do you mean by that? Why did you bring that, that up? Well, I mean, another term that I like to use is rhino skin. <laughs> you know, it, this, this, uh, especially when I, when I started in, in the traditional world, it, it was very difficult to get an agent. It is very difficult to get a publishing contract mm. and there is lots of rejection. And if, if that rejection prevents you from going forward, you'll, you'll never make it. It's it, the, in the old system, it was all about overcoming rejection and most writers the overwhelming majority of writers had numerous rejections before they ever got something accepted so it's just it's a matter of perseverance now how do you develop that well you know when my son was playing little league baseball and he was a pitcher he would get very upset if things got out of hand if somebody hit a home run for example and it would affect him so I told him I'm gonna give you this one rule you can have one darn it. And that means that you take your, your glove and you hit it as hard as you can and you say darn it. <laughs> and then you go back and you pitch again. And that t- a writer can do the same thing. You will get rejections. You will get bad reviews. You will get uh, poor sales, uh, whatever it may be. And what you do is go ahead and, uh, and, and darn it up for a while. But don't no more than twenty minutes, and then <laughs> that you get twenty minutes, and then immediately write something, whatever it may be. Write uh, an uh, an idea down, a new a new idea for a book. Work on a new project. Write something in a journal. Mm-hmm. But that get the get the writing muscle going again, and that helps to crowd it out. And that's really what it's all about. You got to keep coming back. And, and producing and you you can do that anybody can do that mm. and I think this is the thing it's very hard when you've just got one book uh, or two books or three books um, right. but you know I've got 15 now and plus another three that have been withdrawn you've got how many books have you got now like I don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be uh, 30 plus. yeah I, I mean perhaps perhaps yeah. that, that's <laughs> That what's available I haven't counted but. yeah quite a lot and and when it gets to a point where you don't have to care about individual books I think mm. it that helps doesn't it the problem is by the time you get to that point you've gone through a lot of the um that those negative things you've talked about so I in the way do you think it does get easier as you have more books in terms of that feeling so attached to them issue? I think so I think so um there used to be sort of a rule of thumb in the traditional book world for novelists that it took f- five novels mm. it, it, to get established it, it you, you had to really write that many and you know there were exceptions of course there were 
There were books that did really well out of the gate, and then there were books that were supposed to do really well that didn't. Mm. But really, you had to think in terms of five books, and that that was a a seven or eight year period usually because you know a book comes out from a publisher maybe every eighteen months at that time. Mm. So what um, indie writers who really are serious about this need to remember if they're just starting out is it does take years to build to a certain point. Now in the indie world you have the ability to move that schedule up because mm. you can produce, you can publish faster than a, a traditional publisher can. But you have to have a certain degree of patience and you have to understand that it's going to take a while. And then along the way you have to do everything with the best quality that you can. And that, not just the writing but you know the cover design and the the book descriptions and all of those things that yeah, we as indies talk about. Mm. Right, so you, you did mention like the traditional world there and I, I wanted to ask you, would you ever consider, I mean, or are you still a hybrid in terms of you have traditional publishing deals or you know, what are your feelings about that right now? Well, I do have, uh, I just finished a, a book for Writer's Digest Books, another book on writing and the reason for that is that I like the company. They, we negotiated a good contract. I got good terms from them, and I thought that I thought it was a fair deal. And they know how to move writing books and so on. So those, that was a consideration. And I've, I've worked with them before. I like them. And uh, so, as far as fiction writing goes, as you know, as we all know, it's a very challenging time both for both traditionally published fiction writers and the companies. Mm-hmm. You know, the Authors Guild has come out with this big push to try to get quote unquote fairer contract terms for authors. And there are a whole number of terms that publishers have been holding firm on, but that's because they have to. In their business, their business is so challenging now. They it's economics. They really, they're in a tough spot. They can't give away the store, uh, so to speak. So from my, my perspective, it would always depend on the offer, the terms, and so forth. What I like about indie publishing is that I own the rights forever. Um, I can control the quality. I can publish when I'm ready. Mm-hmm. I can produce what I want. Um, so certainly, no, no author closes the closes the door on all the options. See, that's what it's all about. We've got options. Hmm. So, but right now, I think if if new authors want to go the traditional route, be sure to educate yourself on what the contract terms are, what the standard issues are, and work with your agent and uh, do what's best for your career and. Uh, there's still a traditional publishing industry and they still produce books and some of those books do very well. Mm, yeah, so uh, basically what you're saying is you're, you're weighing it up on a uh, case-by-case basis. Um, Absolutely. And choosing things that work for you as a business, not an emotional decision. Well, that's a- exactly right. You know, it is, for example, um, a, a dream of many writers to see a printed book published by a big New York company. Okay, that's an emotional thing. It's a it's a nice thing. I mean, I loved it. Mm. You know, you get a box of those books and there it is and but then those books have to sell. Those books have to be on a shelf. Mm. You know, that's another dynamic that the book book shelf space is is shrinking out there. So Ra- don't be just emotional about the decision. Certainly emotion can play a part, desire and dream can play a part, but also this is a hard-headed, uh, numbers-driven business. It certainly is for the publishers. So they will nurture your dream until it's costing them money, and then they won't nurture it anymore. So be sure you take that into account as well. Mm. And then just looking forward, because uh, you also talk about, uh, you also say a successful business makes a profit. To make a profit, you need a plan. So um, given that we're seeing changes every single month in the indie world, uh, what does your plan look like for the next year or two? What do you see coming? Well, I, you know, number one, I do have a, a master projects board, a cork board. Uh, it's, a, it's a virtual cork board in Scrivener. Uh. But I have uh, I have 
probably 30 projects wow. on there but that are prioritized. So, I mean, some of those projects are ones that I've long wanted to do, but in terms of what would be the best uh, use of my time, I prioritize those projects. So, really, the top five are the ones that I really concentrate on at any in any given moment. So, going, I, I writers should be like a movie studio. That they they are shooting a movie, they're developing a movie, they're acquiring new ideas, and so on. You you need to be developing your material all the time and getting it ready to write. So that that's the fundamental. Um, the basic fundamentals of what I do is is to produce and to decide what to produce. Now, in terms of changes in the indie world, you know, there the, the new Kindle Unlimited um, payout plan is something that a lot of writers are looking at. Um, I have not made any decisions on that because I haven't seen enough data, but uh, that might be something to consider in the future. And uh, you know, for all all writers. Especially ones that are getting just getting started, um, but right now I enjoy being widely read, widely spread on on various retailers. And um, the other thing is, uh, the changes that come are really out of our control. Mm -hmm. They're out, they're out of our control, and what we have to do as writers is be like. Um, corks on a roiling sea you know that, that we're, we just keep our head above water and we we go with the tide and we analyze what's going to happen and uh, and what is happening and we do our best mm. so as long as you're producing the words i don't think that fundamental is ever going to change uh you just you keep in touch uh you read the creativepen.com all the time and you keep in touch on the podcasts and you just learn and and uh keep the information flowing Oh, good. Happy times ahead. <laughs> I think so. They've yeah. been happy times so far. Yeah, we're both very ha uh, happy people, aren't we, Jim? <laughs> I think so. I do. <laughs> right. Well, it's always lovely to talk to you. Tell people where they can find you and your books online. Well, just go to jamesscottbell.com and uh, you can sign up for my email alerts so that I will just tell you when new deals come up from me and new books are available and uh, all my books are there and you can uh, browse around to your heart's content. And, and one of your latest books that I've just bought is 27 Fiction Blunders and How Not to Make Them, which is a must-buy title. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a book I wanted to do for a long time because over the years I've seen and read so many manuscripts from new writers and I've seen a number of of errors that have been committed and I just wanted to write a book that would address those and be a good reference. It is. It's fantastic. So thanks again for your time, Jim. That was great. Always good to talk to you.